Good morning. It's Happy Easter to all of us. Um, the message I have today is about Easter, of course, and what it kind of stands for. And it's also about Easter baskets and flamingos. And believe me, it all ties in together. Um, I'll start off with the Easter basket because that's sort of something that everybody does. And, you know, you can take offense at the Easter bunny versus what really Easter stands for. But I just saw something, and it's like, to me, this is just a wonderful way to help children understand. And what it was, it was a, a post about what you can do for Easter. And you can adapt it to different things in your own life. They had an Easter basket. The children each got Easter baskets, okay? Pretty looking, beautiful baskets that were woven. And that represents their hearts. And the day or so before Easter, the children are told to go out in the yard and collect like rocks, and put the rocks in the baskets. So the kids would pick up little small stones or regular jagged rocks in their baskets. And that supposedly represents the sins and the sin nature of man. So then what this mother did, even though her children are young, she's trying to bring Christ into it, she took a red piece of cloth and put it over the stones the night before Easter. And that represents the blood of Jesus. So you think about it, the children have their beautiful hearts and sin and stones come in to fill it and you get that stony heart. The blood of Christ and what happens do you think in the morning when the children come to remove the red cloth just as the stone was removed from the tomb? Well, of course the rocks were now gone and it was replaced by some of the traditional Easter, or it could be an Easter book, or something more spiritual in nature versus just the candy. And I thought too often we get away from things like that. And it, it's sad to say that we live in this, this world over here, and this is our spiritual world, and sometimes there's just a big wall between it. But sometimes when you can bring something of spirituality into something that is kind of worldly and use that like to teach children, that's really important because children are like little sponges and they take up everything. So what happens is, uh, I was listening to something the other day and it was an article in the Christian Post and they had done some sort of a poll. And they did a poll of a lot of people. But all these people were either proclaimed believers, Christians, churchgoers, pastors, a lot of people. And they had to be at least in church attendance for at least a year. It wasn't someone who just, like, became a Christian. They had to be at least a year following faith, good study, steady, you know, supposedly church-going, Bible studies and all. And that's what the poll was made of. And they asked them one question. And I bet you probably, you may have heard this term, you may not have. This group may have, I don't know. But it's like, what is the Great Commission? Now, how often do people know what the Great Commission is? They found out in this poll that only 17% of the people knew what that meant. I'm trying to take a guess. Yeah. Is it God's commission for our life? You're kind of right. But the thing is, is do you hear that in normal churches and every day being taught about? It used to be, in this poll, they said the old timers, that is some of us older people, um, some of us old timers were the only ones, that 17%, that even knew what the term meant, the Great Commission. But they looked at the millennials, and most of the millennials had no clue. Over 51% had never even heard the term. Some of them said, I've heard of it, but I don't know what it is. And they could not relate it, like, to the Bible. They couldn't even think outside the box. They couldn't even think, like, what, what, what could the Great Commission of the Lord be? And to me, the Great Commission is what Easter's all about, really. So... Too many times churches, instead of looking at teaching the word, and we talk about this periodically, talk about growth and entertainment and, oh, do you have a trendy pastor who's, you know, in with the coffee clatches and all that, versus teaching the word, teaching what the Bible actually says to us. And so, therefore, of course, all of our children are never going to hear the word Great Commission. They're not even going to be able to figure out on their own what it could possibly be. So, anyway, I just picked out two verses that we're going to talk about because it's Easter, and it's about the Great Commission. So I told you my Easter basket story, but what about the flamingos? I said I'd talk about flamingos. So I'm going to read from the Word of God in a minute. 
about the Great Commission. Just a little bit, just so you know where it is in there. Okay, flamingos. Okay, what color are they? They are what? Pink. Pink. Why are they pink? They don't have hair. They don't have hair. Anyone else know? Well, you know. Why are they pink? And this is so important, and it, hopefully you'll remember this sometime and maybe share it with someone. A flamingo is pink because of his diet. A flamingo is pink because he eats like a little shrimp. And he has other things that has beta carotenes in it. Beta carotenes give the pink color. They're actually born kind of gray. They're born gray. Kind of, yeah. But the flamingo is known for its beauty and it's above all animals, it's beautiful pink color. People are like, oh wow, look at the flamingos in the front yards. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen some of them. But it's because they eat certain diets. And I was telling my son on the way in, did you know that when you have a baby who's maybe introduced to carrots, because you always introduce like one food at a time to make sure there's no allergies. If you have a baby who's introduced to carrots and that child loves carrots, and the mom gives it, oh well, I'm gonna feed the kid carrots. He loves this vegetable three times a day, every day, blah, 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 blah. That child will actually start to turn a little orange. It's a known fact. Now, a baby's skin is a little more transparent than ours, and the beta carotenes can even do it in a person to an extent, because it's in some medical books. Well, you come in, my kid's skin color is off, and the doctor will say, did you introduce carrots recently? Do they eat a lot of carrots? And it's like, yeah. So what does this have to do with reading the word and flamingos and what they're eating? Oh, so what they eat, what they are fed, is what they become. So if you are being fed the real, true word of God, are you going to be more like that beautiful flamingo with the pink, with your peace, joy, and contentment for all to see? Or are you going to be just a kind of regular, dull, white kind of gray bird? So, that's why it's so important to kind of, even if you don't know the whole Bible, know that there's parts in there and that they have messages for us. And so let's get back to Easter so we can end this up. Um, and in Easter, there's a few, few verses that are kind of more important than others. And if you go to Mark 16, Mark 16 is about the resurrection. Okay, So Mark 16 talks about the Sabbath was over in Mary Magdalene and how she comes to find the tomb empty and goes to tell the people. But later on in that verse, it goes into the dis disciples who are commissioned. Okay, And a lot of Bibles actually, this is my amplified, it says the disciples commissioned. Oh. So there's the word even in here, but a lot of people didn't even know what the Great Commission was. So it says, Later Jesus appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he called them to account for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen from death. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. The Great Commission. He who believes in me and has been baptized will be saved from the penalty of God's wrath and judgment. But he who has not believed will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed in my name, and they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. And they will pick up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will get well. So then... When the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he had taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out, and they preached everywhere where the Lord was working with them and confirming the word by the signs that followed. That's the Great Commission. And we know this and we talk about it, but it's just another way to explain it to somebody. You know, we have a job that God told us to do. We are to do what Father has showed us. You know, Father in us will allow us to do these things. And just the last one that you've also heard before, I'm sure you have heard it, is, and there's other places too, and go into Matthew 28. And Matthew 28, once again, is a story from a different perspective of Jesus being risen. So Matthew's telling the story at the same time, but at the same thing at the end of this verse, it says, the Great Commission. And there it is, even in print right then. And it's kind of like a title for Matthew um, 28, 16. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but they doubted that it was really 
8. And Jesus came up and said to them, All authority, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go therefore and make disciples of all nations, help the people to learn of me, believe in me, and obey my words, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of any circumstances and occasion. So that is the Great Commission. And that, to me, is an Easter message. Two verses. You know, they tell the same story, but we are to go out to do what Jesus has done with the Christ in us. And what's more Eastery than that? Is there anything else? I mean, it's just a wonderful thing. And so I think in closing, I will say that we need to kind of just sometimes wake ourselves up and prepare to do what the Great Commission is. Now, I had not heard that term most of my life growing up. This Catholic Methodist churches and on. Somewhere I heard it at a random church service where they had an altar call and they talked about the Great Commission. And I'm trying to think, that was one of the times in my life that all of a sudden my cry out for more knowledge and more wisdom spiritually, it came to me. I was sitting there in this audience and, and it was like they talked about the Great Commission. And that was some 10, 12 years ago at least. And I think that was a very important part of my life because someone, we have a commission to do. I had never heard it put that way. I'd always, God, what do, I, what do you want me to do? But I was always asking, what? Here it is. Here it is in print, what we are supposed to do for him. And to me, it wakened me up. It just gave me energy and excitement about to try to read and find out where these things were. So in those 10, 12 years or whatever, I think I've had more growth, but I finally knew what the Great Commission was. And so maybe just knowing that, you might be able to reach other people like I was reached. We have a commission to do, if you want to use that term. We are to live like Christ did and to help others. So happy Easter to all of you. I'm done.